optical science of why vampires have no reflection. I'm Raymond Rumpf. I'm the EM professor at EMPossible.net. In this video, I'm going to explain to you the very real science of why vampires don't have a reflection in a mirror. If you want to learn more about me or about the courses we offer at EM Possible, visit the websites I have listed at the bottom of this slide. It's very well known that vampires don't have a reflection from a mirror. It's usually explained that they're undead, they don't have a soul, therefore their light doesn't reflect off of a mirror. But this is completely absurd. Think about everything else in the room. That doesn't have a soul, yet that reflects off the mirror. Other times it's explained as the silverback mirrors burn up the vampire's reflection due to their evil or not having a soul or something like that. That is also completely absurd because other mirrors that aren't based on silver also don't have a reflection for vampires. It turns out the reason for this is not supernatural at all. There is a very scientific explanation that I'm going to step you through in this video. In fact, the phenomenon can even be reproduced in the lab, and I'll show you our work on this at the end of this video. So in this, I'm gonna step you through every single step of this, I'm going to cite everything so that you can follow it up to verify or learn more, or maybe even perform your own experiments. Light is an electromagnetic wave, and all electromagnetic waves, whether they're radio waves or light or x-rays, they're all generated the same way, and that's by accelerating charge. If the charge is not moving, or even if it's moving at a constant speed, it will not radiate. Here I'm showing a charge oscillating vertically. So the acceleration is vertical. That will radiate as I'm showing here. The really important thing here and the takeaway from this slide is the pattern of that radiation. Notice the radiation is strongest in the horizontal direction. There is zero radiation in the vertical direction. And this is going to become very important later in the video. Next, I want to talk about how light reflects from an ordinary mirror. So being an electromagnetic wave, light is composed of both an electric field and a magnetic field. And in this animation, I'm showing the electric field with the blue arrows and the magnetic fields with the red arrows. The equations that I'm showing here are called Maxwell's curl equations. So it's two coupled partial differential equations. I don't want to get too deep into the math but it's really the coupling of the energy between the electric and magnetic fields that produces waves. Now in this equation, this little multiply symbol here, if you're not really familiar with vector or vector calculus, this is called a vector cross product. And it actually says that ordinary electromagnetic waves, the electric and magnetic fields will be perpendicular to each other and also perpendicular to the direction of the wave. So this is called a transverse electromagnetic wave. And this is what we have almost all of the time. The last thing I'll talk about is it's the direction of the electric field, what I'm showing in blue, that defines what we call the polarization of light. Light has a polarization or a direction associated with it. Now the direction of the light, I'm not talking about the direction that the light is traveling. In this case, the light is traveling in the Z direction. I'm talking about the direction of the electric fields. Notice the electric field is always oscillating along a single axis, a single line. So we would call this a linearly polarized wave. Let's look more closely of how this wave interacts with the mirror. Well, mirrors are made of metals. Metals have very big atoms with lots of electrons and those electrons break away from those atoms very easily. So inside a metal, there's all of these free electrons that can just move around. That makes them great conductors. That's why we use them in wires for electricity. Now through the Lorentz force law that I'm showing here, the electric field component of light will put a force on those charges and it will move them. It will push them up and down. So when the light hits the metal, it's pushing these free electrons up and down. It is accelerating those charges. Well, what do we know about accelerating charges? Accelerating charges radiate. When that happens, 
we get the reflected light. Now each one of those charges actually radiates in this donut radiation pattern. So that will be primarily in what I'm showing here as the XZ plane. We really won't get too much radiation in the Y direction. So we'll radiate light into the metal or into the mirror, out from the mirror, and also in the direction of the mirror. Now metals are incredibly lossy to light. So any of the radiation into the mirror or horizontal to the mirror, if it's in the mirror, it gets absorbed extremely quickly and in fact converted to heat. But it's that outward radiation that we see as reflected light. And you probably didn't know that reflection from a mirror was actually this complicated, but now you understand the reason that light reflects. I mentioned previously that light is polarized. So that is what the electric field does as the wave propagates. So in this picture, the electric field is always oscillating along the direction of the Y axis. So this is linearly polarized. And in almost all materials and in the vacuum of space, whatever polarization the light has, it stays the same. It does not change. However, there are some special or even exotic materials that can change the polarization of a wave as that wave, the light wave, is propagating through it. Particularly, I'm talking about something called optical activity. And in a medium that is optically active, it stays linear, but the direction that the field is oscillating begins to rotate as the field propagates through the medium. And I'll show that in a second. Now, it seems super exotic, but in fact, if you dissolve sugar in water, that will rotate optical polarization. And there's lots of applications out there that are used for optical activity. For example, I mentioned sugar. Well, the food industry uses this to measure the sugar content in things like syrup. The medical industry will use that to measure certain things about drugs. And optical activity is the key principle behind liquid crystal displays. Now for a material to be optically active, it has to have some chiral properties about it. So it needs to be made of something that is spiraling or in some sort of corkscrew kind of pattern. Now, some structures, it's not quite obvious that it's a spiraling chiral type pattern, but it will rotate polarization. And here I'm showing these little curlicue kind of structures, but notice what's happening with the electric field. Let's look at the electric field at one point in the beginning of entering this material. That electric field is oscillating only along a single direction. So when I talk about polarization rotation, if I'm looking at a fixed point, I'm not talking about a polarization that would swing around the z-axis at this fixed point. That would be called circular polarization. Instead, this wave is always linearly polarized because I can always look at one point and always see that electric field oscillating in a single direction. The thing is, the direction of that electric field changes as it's propagating through the medium. And you can see as I'm showing here, by the time it leaves the medium at the other side, it's oscillating completely in the X direction and not the Y direction. And when that wave leaves, it would maintain that polarization state. Now, something else I should mention, as this wave propagates, if something were to make that reflect and it would leave the lattice at the other side, this optical activity does not undo that rotation. In fact, it adds to it. And this is very special too. It's called being non-reciprocal. So when the wave reflects, it would exit this material uh, on the left side here, and it would maintain whatever polarization it left with. I want to point out that this optical activity can be found in nature. A great example that I really love are these jewel beetles. So in its exoskeleton, it has chiral structures that produce optical activity. In this case, it gives it that brilliant colored metallic sort of look. But you'll find optical activity or structures that lead to optical activity in fish, in butterflies, other beetles, and probably other places I'm not even thinking. Here, I'm showing a picture of a scanning electron microscope image of a sample of actual vampire skin. Now, a vampire is an undead entity. So during the transition from alive to vampire, the skin partially dehydrates, and it's also reacting to the presence of post-mortem vampire blood. So this causes histological changes in the epidermis layer of the skin. That's the outer layer.
So what you're seeing here is not what the epidermis layer looks like for a normal human being. This is after the vampiric transition. Now, during death, the cell membranes normally break down. This is called cell lysis. But vampires need to stay intact. So during the vampiric transition, the cell lysis is prevented by a strengthening of the cell membranes. So we have this combination of dehydration and strengthening of the cell membranes that ends up forming these strands of loops in the epidermis layer. Now, some parallels can be drawn to the chiral structures that we looked at before, but those were corkscrew structures. The loops were perpendicular to the direction of the light, like a corkscrew. Here, the loops are really in the direction that the light will be propagating, in the direction of the strand, and we can think of these maybe more as like loops on a roller coaster. So in optical science, since this is no longer a a chiral structure. This is called a metachiral structure. But they interact with light very analogously with the chiral structures and optical activity. It's just that the rotation is slightly different that we'll see in a minute. Now we're looking at the results of an electromagnetic simulation using a technique called finite difference frequency domain. It is a rigorous method in that it obtains a rigorous and exact solution to Maxwell's equations but it's also incredibly simple to learn and easy to implement and very easy to incorporate additional types of physics. I think it should be the most popular method in computational electromagnetics. It is not, but it's a great technique, especially if you want to just get started in computational electromagnetics and you're not sure where to start because it can literally simulate anything and is probably the easiest method. So we're looking at propagation through an array of these metachiral structures and notice that the light is propagating in the direction of the strands. And just like in an optically active material, the polarization is rotating. However, before we saw it rotate from the Y to the X axis, here it's rotating from the Y to the Z axis. So the polarization is always staying in the Y Z plane, but by the time it's exiting this material, the polarization is completely longitudinally polarized. Now I'm having this frame sort of rotate around so you can see this from the back to show that that polarization is always in the Y Z plane and there's never any X component to that. Now, while longitudinal polarization isn't necessarily the most common thing in the world, it's not unknown. We see longitudinally polarized waves in plasmas, in some metamaterials, and other configurations. But I want to draw an analogy here to optical activity because I think that's the best way to understand that. And there's three commonalities with optical activity. First, if the wave were to reflect somewhere in the middle of this and come out, this metachiral structure does not undo that polarization rotation. In fact, it just keeps rotating and it adds to it. So this is also non-reciprocal. That's a second commonality to a, a chiral media. And then the last thing is that when the wave leaves this, the polarization is retained, whether that's transmitted or reflected. We're finally ready to say why vampires have no reflection in a mirror. So let's revisit this problem of a wave incident on a mirror, but now we know we have a longitudinally polarized wave that is reflected from vampire skin. So I'm showing a longitudinally polarized wave that's propagating in the positive Z direction and it encounters a mirror. Due to the Lorentz force equation, those electric fields put a force on the charges and oscillate them now in the Z direction. So that's in a direction uh, in and out of the metal. They're not actually leaving the metal. They're just moving in that Z direction. Remember the dipole radiation pattern. Each one of those moving charges will radiate in this pattern. In other words, it sends the radiation primarily in the XY plane, so in the X and Y directions. There is zero radiation in the positive or negative Z directions. And the light that's radiated in the XY plane here, or parallel to the mirror, the metal's very lossy. That essentially gets absorbed. But since there is zero radiation in the Z direction, that means there is no reflected light. We would have to oscillate these charges in either the Y or the X direction in order to get radiation outward. But that happens with a transverse wave, not a longitudinally polarized wave that reflects from a vampire.
I mentioned at the beginning of the video that it is possible to mimic vampire skin experimentally. So here is the results of that experiment, and we're calling this our artificial vampire skin, or our AVS for short. So what I've done is I've arranged some Halloween items here along with our AVS sample. And if we look at the reflection in the mirror, we can see that this AVS sample is not there. And we now understand that light that gets reflected from the AVS becomes longitudinally polarized, which does not produce a reflection in the mirror, but everything else reflects transversely polarized waves, which do reflect from the mirror. So let's think about how we made this block and what it is made from. So inside this is a unit cell that has one loop of a metachiral structure. So this is a unit cell, meaning this is stacked on top of itself in all three dimensions. So you can imagine as this is stacked left to right, this would form our metachiral strand. And to give you an idea of the size of this, uh, the linear dimension here is about 225 nanometers. So in this block, there's roughly 40,000 unit cells along one face. So the total size of this is 40,000 unit cells by 40,000 unit cells by 40,000 unit cells. And we fabricated this using multi-photon lithography. Sometimes you'll hear this called two-photon absorption, but the process of curing the polymer with exposure to light sometimes involves more than two photons, so it's more correctly called or more generally called multi-photon polymerization. Now, because we are fabricating it that way, where you essentially shine light on a sample that cures some spots and others, and we have to wash the resin out, we had to make an inverse structure here where this loop is actually air and the rest is dielectric or the resin. And that's because if we made only dielectric loops, those would not hold themselves up. They wouldn't be supported by anything and the structure would just collapse. So this is solid resin with this air hole forming this loop. So there it is. It's an artificial vampire skin that exhibits all of the properties of actual vampire skin. Thank you so much for listening to this video. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned a lot. Please visit our academic website at eimpossible.net. And if you want to learn more about me or the research that I do, check out RaymondRumpf.com. Please like and subscribe. That helps me a lot. Happy Halloween, everyone.